That's like a base of the power of I can't. It's so easy to live in denial. And I would say for anybody listening, if you hear yourself saying things like, I'm just tired today. I just don't feel good today. And then you're thinking, but tomorrow, but then tomorrow comes and you're saying the same thing. <laughs> Been there, done that. <laughs> Same here for me. <laughs> Cue music. Places, everybody places. We're starting in three, two. Welcome to the Autoimmune Hour, where we look at the rise of autoimmune disorders. I've brought together top experts that range from doctors, specialists, nutritionists, researchers, and even those recovering from autoimmune to bring you the latest, most up-to-date information about autoimmunity and how to live your life uninterrupted. Thank you for joining us here on the Autoimmune Hour with Sharon Saylor. Always seek sound legal, medical, and or professional advice regarding any problems, conditions, and any of the recommendations you see, hear, or read here on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio. Join the Autoimmune Hour's Courage Club. Sign up now at understandingautoimmune.com. Now, back to your host, Sharon Saylor. Welcome, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com. And as always, it's my honor and pleasure to be be with you here on another brand new episode. I still got a bit of that schnozzle thing going on from the last week. So I apologize if you hear that in my voice. Not much I can do about it, but I am on the road to recovery, which is fantastic. I'm praising my immune system every single minute of the day for doing such a good job of helping me through that latest thing. I mean, you know, we do our best and sometimes we just are in the wrong place, wrong time and catch something. But thank goodness my immune system kicked in and is doing really well. So that's great. And giving my immune system gratitude. I want to share that idea with you guys that when your body is performing the way it's supposed to be performing and it's doing something right, I always like to verbalize that, not just think it, but verbalize it with some thank you body. Thank you, immune system, for kicking in. Thank you for continuing to heal those sorts of things. I think that gratitude part is so important. And I've got my tea here. Let me take a quick drink. Um, mm. Yeah, that's really good. Probably be drinking that throughout the day. I am so excited because we have a longtime friend on the show. We've had her on the show before, and I've been following some of her beautiful Facebook posts. She lives in Florida, and she sends some of the most scenic, beautiful sunrises and sunsets, things like that. And I reached out to her. I said, hey, come back on the show. Let's talk. Because she's one of her strengths or things that I want to talk about is boundary setting. And also, we're, I don't know, who knows? You know me. <laughs> we're just going to run with it. <laughs> so let me read her bio here. Her name is Simone John Giordano. And I have to say that really slowly because I always kind of get it messed up. And then with the schnozzle nose, I'm sure it would come out very strange. But we all lovingly call her Simone G. And she's a lifestyle and business coach. And she is the author of I'm trying to remember the whole name Simone. It's a I can't um, the power of I can't the power of I can't anyway, that's Simone's voice there. And it's a wonderful book about when we have autoimmune conditions. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's really tough. But we have understanding what our limitations are and not letting our limitations define our life. I think that's the key point that Simone likes to talk about. Welcome, Simone. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me here again, Sharon. It's great to be back. I always enjoy talking with you. Absolutely. And I wanted to talk to you first about this idea of the power of I can't. We talked about it in our previous interview, Mm -hmm. but just if they haven't heard that, describe for them why I can't. Because sometimes people will say, oh, that just sounds, mm, I don't know, like, like, I don't, I don't, know, I don't know what it was. Like. <laughs> it can sound like an excuse. It can sound like an excuse because it often is an excuse, a fear-based excuse. However, the power of I can't is actually a paradox, ultimately so that you can. So it's really about self-acceptance, learning to listen to your body, learning to listen to where you are right are at right now at this time, so you can make the best decisions for you and even for those around you, for your work and to enjoy life more and feel better. So it's a paradox, if that's a <laughs> great, great way to sum it up there. It's ultimately so that you can. And the example, I'll, I'll share how I 
actually put a name to it the first time. I realized I had been doing it for many, many years. When I moved to Florida, um, again, we moved for the well-being of my health, especially my lungs. And I wanted to go to a yoga class. Now I had a bad fall four days after a honeymoon. <laughs> And I was told I would never look up and I struggled to use my arms. I, at that time, I could hardly lift my arms away from my thighs, but I really wanted to go to yoga and I know how to modify. <laughs> I've had a lot of one-on-one -on -one training between yoga and Pilates and, and that kind of activity. I kept telling myself, I can't go until, I can't go until. And finally, I realized I can't look up. I can't use my arms. I am not going to be able to do what most everybody in that class is doing, but I'm going to go anyhow. <laughs> and so I went a few minutes early and I talked to the, in, um, the yoga instructor and I said, look, I'm, I may hardly be able to do anything but you're doing, but do you mind if I sit, put a mat out in the back of class and participate? And she was great because she's like, oh yeah, just make yourself at home. I'm so glad to have you here. So very inclusive. And I probably did about 10% of what the class was doing because I couldn't lay flat. <laughs> I couldn't lift my arms. I couldn't look up. It was very empowering to say, I can't do this. And it's okay. It doesn't make me less human. It doesn't make me weak. It doesn't do any of that. I'm still me. I just can't do those activities. It's removing the judgment. Mm, yes. Part of me wanted to add yet. But then I thought, as you said, removing the judgment, even saying, I can't do this yet, that's a judgment, isn't it? That's fascinating. It is. And ironically, <laughs> by through acceptance, you start to be able to come up with different solutions. You start to think differently. So what is it I want to accomplish? How can I? Where are, are my limitations? How can I work around those? How can I develop other avenues to get to where I want while protecting my well-being? And ironically, what happened here is I was never supposed to look up after all the MRIs and everything. That was never going to happen through a couple people found an individual who... It was painful, but he, I can look up now. <laughs> it's 11, 11 years. I was not able to do that. And when I did that, my husband's jaw, jaw just dropped and I couldn't, you know, I couldn't lift my arms like that. And nor was I ever really supposed to be able to. So it's not having the expectation of yet. However, by, I think through mindset changes, you become more open and more curious as how you can expand your abilities? How can you, you know, ex ex be curious to better support your well-being around your limitations? And that's important. There is, we all have limitations. We don't like to admit it, probably, especially to ourselves for a spell of time. Oh, absolutely. That's what the power of I can't is really, that's like a base of the power of I can't. It's, it's so easy to live in denial. And I would say for anybody listening, if you hear yourself saying things like, I'm just tired today. I just don't feel good today. And then you're thinking, but tomorrow, but then tomorrow comes and you're saying the same thing. <laughs> Been there, done that. <laughs> same here for me. <laughs> know it well, no judgment. But those are signs that we aren't living true to where we are in the present moment. And if we aren't living true to where we are in the present moment, we can't be making the best decisions. And what happens from like a work perspective, if you're an entrepreneur and work from home, you feel better a couple of days. So you work more, you want to catch up, you do more, you work longer hours. Maybe you work more intensely. Maybe you're like, you know, crunching up and stuff because you got to catch up. And then the next day comes or a couple of days later, depending on the individual and circumstances, and you're not feeling good. Maybe you need to be some one person might be down in bed for a couple of days. Another person might be cognitively trying to, you know, function the same. Another person may be having more pain, just depending on what your limitations are, they flare up, they act up, they present themselves. And then you get over that and okay, it's time to go again. I got to catch up. And it's just the cycle of setbacks up and down often because of denial. So if you say, wait a minute, where are my real limitations? And, and with self-compassion, accept those. Then you can start to address them and even your pace. And what I have found with people, Sharon, it, and myself, 
you might say, hey, I can only work six hours a day or four or whatever. And instead of trying to work a threshold above that, and in the end, individuals are able to work more productively with greater efficiency and more hours because you, you level out that cycle of setbacks. Oh, fascinating. That's the power of I can. It's acknowledging the limitations of where you are now. I want to ask the question about, so I'm acknowledging the limitations of where I am now. And part of me, I'm hearing this little voice on my shoulder here going, how do I leave room for that to improve? Some part of me is sort of arguing, well, if you mm -hmm. accept it, Sharon, that means it has this sort of forever and ever mentality thing, voice going on here in my head going, oh, if I accept it, that means I'm stuck with it. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> This um, is really interesting. I have this conversation yeah, going on, yeah. this argument going on no, in my head with it. <laughs> it's great. And that's where self-compassion, I think it's like, yes, I'm trying to think of a good example right offhand of maybe if I you want a worker lifestyle example. Well, I think the one that comes to my head was even when I got my diagnosis, it was sort of like, it took a while to accept it. And then when okay. I did, I went into this mode of, well, I'll show you. I'm not yeah. going to be those stats. Yes. And I've had success with that at times, but not long-term. Yeah. That's actually where part of the power of I can't came in is the culture of I can't, I can do this. If I'm just stronger, if I just push more. If I just mind over body, I can do this. But what happened was for, for myself, many, many, many years ago, I can do this. I can push through the situation. My lungs are my weak point. And I would end up in the emergency room almost too late. I've had several emergency room doctors, you know, get on my case saying, you're waiting too long. This is how people die because I can do this. I can push through this. So it can be depending on the situation, almost life threatening. Now that's not going to always be the norm, obviously. However, um, with any diagnosis, I think it comes along with needing a period to grieve, to lean into the reality of it. Right. So by accepting that and leaving a period to grieve, it's a process. And everybody's journey is just as we're all unique. The journey is unique. It's interesting you bring that up because when I was diagnosed, it, it was pretty <laughs> raging. You know, the skin rashes were absolutely yeah. obvious. <laughs> People were like afraid <laughs> to see you on the street. We're like, what? Walk, move to the other side. <laughs> yeah, it might be <laughs> contagious, which it's not, but it really looked awful. And, but I'm thinking of this idea of grieving. That was never in my mind about thinking back. I'm not sure I ever accepted that as an option or anybody mentioned it as an option mm -hmm. I, they were like okay we're going to get you in to see this specialist and you need to take this pill and you you know it was just all about action which I'm sure I needed because I was pretty sick at that moment I had waited too long to get diagnosed too mm -hmm. thinking oh I'll take care of it myself and looking back it wasn't until at least a year or so into it that I grieved although by that time here again, I'm judging myself. Wow, I'm really judged. I'm a really judgy person of myself. I think we all um, are, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that like part of the journey to learn to be less self-judgmental? I think so. We'll talk about that. Because <laughs> the thing is, I'm thinking about is when I finally did stop to grieve, part of me is like, oh, Sharon, this is it. Get over it. You know, you're not going to, by dwelling on what, sh what could have been, should have been, blah, blah, blah you're not doing yourself any favors. Wow. Um, my mind had so many, yeah. When you say about not dwelling on, I guess just like caregiving from my father, I wanted to be really present. I wanted to be there. I wanted to lean into the hard times. And as a result, it was a really inspiring, peaceful time in my life being there. And same kind of thing. And when we sold the family home, you know, and, and did all the work to help empty it and stuff, I wanted to be present. I wrote like this contemplative uh, essays on like growing up where I did kind of thing just for my own purpose. And so it was my way to lean in and be grateful. You started out talking about gratitude. Mm -hmm. So with the health challenges, it's, it's hard 
but to be able to kind of lean in a little bit and acknowledge these are the challenges I am having. And here's the thing. When I talk with individuals, everybody, depending on where your baseline was, something that is minor to somebody can be really life-changing to somebody else. Oh, absolutely. Somebody might have 20 things and be able to manage those more than somebody with one thing. Everything's on a spectrum, but it changes our lives. It can change our concept of our identity if we don't lean into it enough and have that self-compassion for ourselves that, you know, my illness doesn't define me. I'm not my health and, and working to change that relationship with the health to befriend it, <laughs> be grateful for what your body is doing. Like you said, be gra- gratitude for your immune system. So even though I couldn't lift my arms, I tried to be grateful for the things I could do at the time. Oh, that's a beautiful way to look at it and be grateful for the things that you could do at the time. And I like to leave open that door of, I don't like the word yet now. It's fascinating. i I love the idea of having this moment of awareness that that's a real judgy word. (laughs) Yeah. And that's what was stopping me from moving forward. Well, I can't go. Yeah. I can't do that stuff yet. And what one year was passing another year is passing. I still couldn't, you know, I wasn't getting anywhere waiting for the yet. (laughs) Yeah. So when you say talk to yourself with self-compassion and be present and lean in, I know what they mean to me. Give us some descriptions of how you were present, because I think oftentimes what happens for me is I can, oh, I'm present. And then within such a short period of time, I've drifted off someplace else. I mean, the monkey chatter takes over. That's true. (laughs) And and here I am judging myself like, well, you can't even meditate correctly, Sharon. (laughs) (laughs) That's human, right? (laughs) Right. <laughs> so being present, I guess, you know, unless you're really, really, really skilled, it, it's not like the, I don't have the abilities or skills of a, I can never say the word correctly, M-O-N-K, monk, monk, <laughs> uh, which monk. is a monk, <laughs> monk, you know, where they've done um, studies of brain waves and, and whatnot, you know, with the neuroscience aspect. However, But see, there I have to give myself grace because I'm not living the contemplative life. And I'm not living that life where I have hours on end to devote to it. And Mm -hmm. I'm in a community that has hours on end to devote to it. Right. I find the distractions of life too often even take me off my healing path. Mm -hmm. And I'm always having to course correct. Yes. And I, I think that's normal. Being present, may, say if you're working at a desk, your desk, and you have pain issues, you know, being present to start to realize when your body's giving those little bit of signals that it's starting to um, lead into a situation that is going to cause you more pain. Maybe, maybe for one person, it might be, Hey, I'm starting to have trouble thinking. I'm feeling pull behind my eyes for another person pain somewhere. Instead of continuing to push through that, learn to recognize it sooner because it's always easier to address things from a preventative standpoint than after. So for example, I, I couldn't work at a desk for years, even five minutes would put me down in bed and I can now, but I still monitor it. I kind of am aware without constantly focusing because it's not about being hypervigilant. That's not healthy. No, that's not healthy. (laughs) It it maybe can help from a learning perspective for very short periods of time, but it's not a healthy place to live. No, but I like to look for the patterns and sometimes those Mm -hmm. periods of hypervigilance, I can begin to see the pattern. Like you, I can't work at a desk for long periods of time, Mm -hmm. but what I've learned is I can do about 30 minutes. So I actually, it's a People find it annoying, but I set my phone Mm -hmm. to alert me every 30 minutes, uh, get up, walk around the house, or if I have the opportunity, walk outside, get some fresh air, hug a tree or two, and really splurge and do like a mile or two around the neighborhood or something. But I find that if I can preemptively, as we were talking about, set up success 
monitors for myself mm -hmm. like that. That's I found helpful to remind myself. So what would happen if you didn't tell yourself that you need to take a break every 30 minutes and you worked four hours? Would you be right. able to show up as, as much for your clients, for yourself, for your family? My answer right now is I have no idea. I think intuitively what would happen, I'd be able to do it mm -hmm. for a day or two. But by the maybe the third or fourth day, I would start be feeling it. And that's the power of I can't. <laughs> I, you're implementing it, <laughs> part of it. <laughs> what I notice about that, though, is that power through part of it is almost running mm -hmm. on the autopilot level for me. So maybe I did get overbooked that day. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I've, I'll power through that. And then I love the part of yours, power of the I can't, because I would just keep next day's schedule as it was, whether I powered through and then all of a sudden I'm like powered through three days. And then I was spending the weekend yeah. yeah, just slugging around. <laughs> so it's consciously choosing the exception days. Is it worth it? Yes or no. Consciously making that decision instead of getting into busy mode. Well, I got to be doing this. I got to be doing, I got to, you know, this has to be done. I need to get this project done. It's making conscious decisions when to make exceptions for a recovery period. And I'll use an example is um, yesterday I walked more than normal. Now, I wouldn't have done that if, if I knew we were going to be recording today. <laughs> I would have done my day differently. As a result, a majority of my day has been focused around pain management and rest. Um, you know, my husband helping me manage pain, because I knew yesterday I had made the decision that I had some space. So this was a good time to up my walking level some. Awesome. Um, so I, I did wake up extra tired this morning as expected. However, I, you know, instead of working a few hours, I used that time to manage pain, to rest and so forth. So had I pre-planned, I would be doing the day before differently. If you're someone who has autoimmune and you do podcasts, whether you're guest or on somebody's, if you do live talking and, or if you have a big presentation, it's knowing what, what can you do to prepare to be the most rested and at your best. Sort of like training for a marathon. Most marathoners are not going to go and do a super hard training the day before. You know, that's a beautiful reframe that takes it out of like, oh my goodness, was poor me and my illness that other people in yes. other situations like marathoners make similar decisions about their schedule mm -hmm. and pacing themselves. And that it's just not you know, the poor me syndrome wallowing around with why me? Yeah. I love that, that we're able to exactly. take ourselves out and say, well, who else would make these kinds of choices? And then we come up with people, all sorts of people besides marathon yeah. runners. I yeah, mean, exactly. I think all sorts of people yeah. who are like, okay, no, uh, to be my best, to be my sharpest, I would going to schedule my day this way. And I'm a big believer that our health doesn't, the physical health does not define us. And I go back to the example that I know so many individuals who have so many health challenges and they're so pleasant and compassionate and to be around. And then there can be an individual who doesn't have any health challenges and can be really kind of miserable to be around. <laughs> Is that a fair statement? Yeah, although I found some of either. <laughs> either. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Even so with health challenges, it doesn't, you know, by being curious, by being grateful, by sharing compassion with others, we don't have to limit ourselves from the perspective of like the poor me, <laughs> like you said, it's one aspect. There's still so much we can do. Absolutely. And one of the things we need to do right now, because I blew past that time, is take a quick commercial break. <laughs> when we'll come back, we'll talk more with Simone about the power of I can't. And I want to get into some nice ways, pleasant ways to set boundaries. I think that's always one that many of our audience are like, oh, but Sharon, <laughs> I want to. <laughs> we'll be right back. Life Interrupted Radio will return after these messages from our sponsors. It's great sponsors like these that keep this show coming to you every week. 
Be sure and stop by lifeinterruptedradio.com to learn more. Your conscious lifestyle on steroids. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. If you're worried your friend may be struggling, remember, you don't have to be there to be there. You can say how while well you will get a fake tattoo. You can ask with an app if it works for you. You could chat on the game, kick off your flip flops. You can ask on your couch while you binge watch. Whatever, whatever, whatever gets you talking. Reach out to a friend about their mental health. Learn how you can help at seizetheawkward.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, and the Jed Foundation. Ohm Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Listen and imagine. It takes five seconds to send a text, and for those five seconds, you're driving blind. Life is worth more than a text. Stay alive. Don't text and drive. Visit StopTextStopRex.org, a message brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Project Yellow Light, Noise, and the Ad Council. Hi, this is Sharon, and of course you know me from here on the Autoimmune Hour. Maybe you don't know I'm also an author. My latest book is for kids. It's Pinky Chenille and the Rainbow Hunters, a winner of a five-star reader's favorite review. It's perfect for your early reader and a great bedtime story for your young adventurers. Check it out over at PinkyChenille.com. That's P-I-N-K-Y-C-H-E-N-I-L-L-E.com. See you there. Welcome back, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com, and our podcast website is UnderstandingAutoimmune.com. Imagine that. <laughs> it's one of those. <laughs> anyway, we're here with Simone John Giordano. I always have to stop and kind of phonetically say her name, but I love her. We call her Simone G because... <laughs> fumble over people's names as you guys know if you've been listening to this show and she is the author of the power of i can't and simone one of the things i wanted to talk about before we jump into boundaries as i mentioned on the closing there into the commercial is is this idea of you had mentioned it just as we're polarity responder (laughs) <laughs> that's me. I mean, you can look into my childhood and realize that I was one of those children. My mom will at- <laughs> absolutely attest to this, that if you said, I can't, you can't, don't do that. It would be Sharon who either did it, you know, touched the hot plate and find out if it was hot or <laughs> I'll show you. Now, one of the things I've learned in my healing process is that's a positive and a negative and learning to harness mm-hmm. the power of I can't in your case or the power in my case of I'll show you has been very helpful. But understanding that it's a balancing act, it's and the, the power of it is great because it's powered me through many successes in my business world, my life. And yet now I'm realizing that in your health and well-being that's not always the best way to approach it. So let's talk about this sort of this, even when it's self-talk, I'll show you when the little person in your ear says, don't, (laughs) or maybe not have that chocolate sundae, whatever. (laughs) I totally understand what you're saying. In fact, for my first business, I remember if I, if I were to pick a theme song, I said, it would be, I'll do it my way. So it almost came even that I still, we, people would say, well, you can't have a business and you know, that kind of stuff. So there are certain situations where that, that powering through, I don't know necessarily the, the word anymore it used to, but any more that almost feels odd for me to say powering through to have the resilience, to have the capacity to keep going can be to our benefit. However, depending on every each individual circumstance, you may find that that isn't doing as much good as you think. It might help you get to a milestone. 
it might help you get to another milestone, but then it might bring you down from a well-being perspective. I think this is a good sample. When I was in Pittsburgh and had my marketing business, I was asked to create a training program for the staff at Duquesne University. And I was like, oh, wow, this is wonderful. It was going to be a four-day training, create and deliver. And I loved the project, a wonderful business opportunity, so good for growth, so good for credibility. Well, and I did it, but <laughs> I ended up having to shut my business down for a year. I powered through, I did it, it went well, but I had a year long shutdown. And that came about because when I wanted, I, the business was doing good and I wanted to sort of grow it more and maybe switch the clientele a little bit and packaging. So I wanted to work with a sales professional. And after an hour long meeting, he sat me down, pointed to a poster on the wall that had a triangle, mind, body, spirit. And he looked at me and he said, look, your mind and your spirit are great, but until you learn how to take care of your body, your health, you are never going to achieve the success you desire. Wow. And I was like, wow. And I had already had two shutdowns in the first three years of my business. This was the third shutdown in the first five years of my entrepreneurial career. I wasn't happy, but I knew he was right. And that night I made the decision to once again, shut it down. I pulled in a pier and transferred all my clients and it was planned for six months. It took me a year. And by the end of that year, I walked a half marathon and I opened a, a hands-on training shop five miles from downtown Pittsburgh. So which, which really gave me the better output, powering through and achieving a big milestone or taking time and saying, I can't do that right now and healing and coming back stronger than ever. Right. Absolutely. So we may not even know what we're missing by powering through. We might be able to do so much more. But there are times that you do, you have a commitment and you do, you do need to power through at times. I will not deny that, but it's a matter of making it a pattern. <laughs> right, your life choice. <laughs> <laughs> and I definitely fell on that. So I get what you're saying. I'm like, I, I, for seven years convinced myself it would not hurt to go up that flight of steps this time. <laughs> And every time I'd get to the top and be disappointed because I'd be pulling myself up, sometimes crawling up on my hands and knees. It hurts so bad. I'm like, it's not going to hurt this time. And every time disappointed. And finally I said, I can't do this. It's going to hurt. I was like, okay, it hurt. Let's go on with the day. Right. <laughs> it gets rid of that second layer of suffering of the disappointment around limitations. I love that second layer from suffering yeah i hadn't i hadn't thought about that oh man i'm just my, my mind's being blown in so many ways that's what i love about simone guys <laughs> <laughs> but that second layer of suffering can take us many places not further just down <laughs> and and just not in our physical well-being of you know maybe i'm not climbing those stairs today wow so, oh man oh this is great does that make does that sound applicable to Oh, mean? absolutely. The number of times. And then <laughs> I'm taking it one step further was that second layer of suffering. Uh, what is that getting you? I mean, what is the point of it? And usually it's a mm -hmm. personal thing. I'm thinking in my mind as I'm thinking of my second layers of suffering. It wasn't from an external pressure point. Yeah. It was something I'm so game I'm playing with myself. It's not an external like somebody's pushing yeah. me that next flight of stairs. And that's so important because there is enough stigma in reality. There is enough real stigma around invisible disabilities and challenges and autoimmune. It's there. Right. Yeah. We're, <laughs> we won't argue that one so, at all. <laughs> so we don't need to add to our own suffering on top of that. It's not doing us a service. So an example, you asked me about being present. On the super, super, super bad days that are so rare now, thank goodness. If I can't count the 60 seconds with the pain, I count the 10. If I can't count the 10, I count the one. One second, I'll get through. One, one. And I might be literally leaning with my head because I can't sit down or lay down, leaning like against a wall, holding me up for an hour or so. One, one, 
one just to get through it, knowing it will pass. It's impermanent. It's going to pass. And then just being grateful it's over instead of the, oh man, that really ruined my day. How am I going to get what, you know, that kind of mind chatter is just, Mm -hmm. okay, give myself the grace, be grateful that it's ended and rest up and be ready to, you know, and then continue on. And, and instead of beating myself up for maybe I made a mistake, maybe I did push myself a little too much that got me in the situation. That's part of the self-compassion. We're going to make mistakes and it's okay. You learn from them and do the best you can. And this is, I'm reflecting on one of our other favorite guests is Sarah Payton. I'm, as you were talking about that, I'm thinking about what unconscious contracts have I written with myself to power through instead of saying, okay, and reflecting on where am I in this present moment and what do I need in this yeah. present one count? That's interesting because I I love this idea of the unconscious contracts that we write with ourselves that keep us doing the same thing over and over again and knowing that it doesn't work. Yeah. Which reminds me of that Einstein quote, I think it is his. Yes. <laughs> Don't quote me on that one, but I think it's his that doing the same thing and and thinking you're going to get the same, you know, better results or something, which is anyway, right, goes back to the cycle of setbacks yeah. around the, the symptoms and so forth. Yeah. Wow. That's fantastic. I wanted to talk too about boundaries because I think a lot of people, we know the word, mm-hmm. we know we're supposed to say no, you know, we know a, a lot of those things, but knowing and doing are two different things. And during the holidays, I said yes to too many things. Mm-hmm. And then I have been spending more time in that healing process since doing that. Mm-hmm. And I want to talk about some graceful ways, some easy ways, if that's, I mean, I, I love this. Sometimes people say, well, it's simple. It's just not easy. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> ways to, to set boundaries. And what tips do you have for people about setting boundaries? Yes, I look at boundaries as they're as unique as you. So somebody, what's the correct boundaries or best boundaries for somebody else is not necessarily the right boundaries for you. So the more you have that inner awareness, and I like to say um, self-awareness is one of the greatest gifts you can give yourself. Then. Well, we're going to have to talk (laughs) about your tips for self-awareness too then. Okay. But let's talk about boundaries and then we're going to bookmark self-awareness tips. The more you have that self-awareness of the impact of something, if it's, if it's, Hey, you're going to go shopping with a friend for two hours, but you know, after an hour, you're going to be hurting. If you know, Hey, if I eat that food or drink that drink, I'm going to have this kind of symptom. If you know, well, yeah, I can do that project, but this is what it's going to cost me then the greater the self-awareness of the impact that it's going to have on you potentially financially, emotionally, or greater impact to your well-being, then the more empowered you are to make the right choice for you. So the boundaries, I think to me are really about, you know, protecting, well, yeah, protecting ourselves. I guess you could look at boundaries two ways. One's an all out, hey, I can't do that activity. Another is, hey, I can mm-hmm. do that activity, but I'm going to need to modify it. Is that okay? So say, say a friend, um, I use example. So walking around town, you're maybe you're sort of doing a touristy kind of thing. And you know that it, based on experience, based on intuition, where you are at that point in time, that if you're out for more than two hours, you're going to be really hurt. And you have this important work project that you want to be able to work on the next day. So you don't want to make the exception then, you know, can you just ask, mention to that person, Hey, I'm going to be great for two hours, but I'm going to need to take off then. Or, Hey, I know you want to spend the day there. How about if I walk with you for an hour and maybe, um, while you're continuing on, I'm going to catch lunch somewhere and rest up so I can be fresh, fresh and, and most engaged with you afterwards. And then do another hour, maybe so working in breaks on your own time. And I had a friend who, when she used to visit me, she'd bring books knowing I'd need to nap. (laughs) So she made it really (laughs) easy on me. (laughs) So, well, I think those are the best kinds of friends, uh, you know, like not just on my boundaries, but here I'm thinking about, well, before you offer these events, from my own perspective, maybe if I 
I say, and I'll bring plenty of books. <laughs> you know? So they're not having to yeah. feel like they have to ask for that. Yeah. Space. So that they don't have, somebody doesn't have to feel responsible for you or, or that they have to maybe hold, and somebody might be, everybody's different, right? But having that, you know, feeling that self-empowered just to say what your true needs are. It, it's simply your true needs. Uh, and so that you, if you frame it in the perspective of, I want to be here really present with you, maybe that's not your choice of words, but I want to have fun while we're out and about. I'm going to be able to have more fun if I can sit by myself for an hour while you shop at this particular store or something like that. Yeah. No, the, then that thing that popped into my mind, though, is that that takes special friends. So um, mm -hmm. not that I'm suggesting that you call your friends list, but, yeah. but maybe be more aware of which friends are uh, taking all you know, all, all of the different sides and mm -hmm. possibilities into consideration. And there are times if you have a good friend who they need support, you know, and you know, that maybe it is one sided for a period of time through a hard time. But if it's ongoing, then it's, it's I'm not, I'm not one to say, hey, you need to end that relationship. But you can put the boundaries mm -hmm. on it. And then you can go back if that is a struggle, then you can go back to the you don't have to give an excuse. <laughs> you can just say no, you can say no, thank you. Those are full sentences. That's true. But, you know, so it depends on the circumstance. But if it's somebody, you know, it could actually strengthen a relationship because if it's because you're trying to hide, it goes back to the power of a can't. If you're trying to hide and pretend like these struggles don't exist or minimize them. And as a result, you're wearing, I look at things, give you energy or drain you. So you're taking away from your well being. You know, what if that friend would be perfectly comfortable? Like, like wow, what an opportunity, you know, perfectly comfortable. And they just don't understand enough yet because you haven't shared. Right. I mean, I'm certainly guilty of that, you know, having not shared enough. So, so people couldn't understand. And it's easy to get into the blame game. Well, they don't understand my needs. Well, I haven't shared them <laughs> in a calm way. <laughs> well, you know, that's fascinating too, because it's one of those questions of, I think then there's that self-censorship of how much do I share yes. <laughs> the, the, before it was, the other person's sort of like going, oh, over. Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes, definitely. Case by case. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Case by case, because I've been around people who have told me their whole life story and I'm trying to dissect in my mind why the difference where I was perfectly OK. And then others who tell me two or three sentences and all of a sudden I'm feeling energetically like whoa okay <laughs> i need to stop and take Does a it breath go back to how you present them hey these i want to spend that time with you i want to enjoy your company i really appreciate this i have the whatever you know if i do xyz i'm going to be too tired to really enjoy the time so you know and you can you don't have to even give diagnoses well, most of the time with all the different words that we use with the diagnoses, they don't know what I mean. Exactly. I remember <laughs> I remember hearing my diagnosis. It was such a long word, I got lost, you know, second syllable. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it didn't really, really make any difference to, in the outcome at all of having that me knowing that how to spell that word, that's for sure. We're <laughs> back down to about nine minutes. And I wanted to just double check. I wanted to have you share with us just some tips and thoughts that I haven't had the, I haven't asked the right question yet. So what, what are some things you'd love to share? I think with one us? of the things when to talk, when to talk about self-awareness is for the power of, I can't really developing that awareness. It's a skill that you can apply ongoing. And it's a skill that starts to become applicable to other things as well. So one of the things I like to do is just say, you know, take a piece of paper out and think about a time, I like to do this in hindsight rather than in the moment. So think of a time where you had a particular flare up. And I realize in different individuals might be the same kind of thing all the time, or it might be a variety pack. So pick one <laughs> and, <laughs> and start to, you know, just take some quiet time, cup of coffee, cup of tea, whatever, and sit in nature and just start asking yourself questions around, okay, when I go back to this situation of how I felt, what was happening that day? 
what was even things like what was the weather what was happening in relationship what was happening with my work and then start backtracking what was the day before did i have any special projects did i go on any special excursions did i you know was I, what did I do differently? Was I moving more? Was I moving less? Was there a regular routine thing that I let go of? And then start backtracking a little bit and, and then, you know, step away from it and go through it again and even, even move to it. And I know it might sound silly and think of the day. What was it? Was it sunny? You know, write out, just journal around it. And then like, I'd like to go through it again and move to it. And I know it sounds funny, but if you're thinking of yourself, putting yourself there in the moment, and uh, it helped me one time, like think, oh yeah, I could hardly lift my arms at that time and help me. It, it brought, it kept bringing more and more things to fruition. So I, I have to ask for a clarity word, like move yeah. to it. You mean like step into it? Like, okay, that day, this is how I was walking. This is how I was feeling. This is like, if you can kind of literally think through that situation, pretend oh, okay. like you're in that day. Yeah. Stepping into that situation. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. And then do the same thing with a good day. And you might notice some patterns there. One of the things I've mentioned on the show before that I like to do with journaling is, and I was taught this years and years ago by a mentor is I write out the specifics mm -hmm. of that day on the right side of the page. And then I leave the left side blank and that allows me to, whether it's the next day or a month or, you know, two months, whatever it is, I go back and I can read that. And on the left side, I can write what's changed or what new insights mm -hmm. I got. Or, yeah. and I can begin to see patterns easier that way. Yeah. And I have an opportunity there to write them on the left side of what's changed. That's some ways that I have found specific patterns that I've had that allow me to continue to find the points where I can continue to optimize like, wow. One of the things that I find really strange is that I can be doing something and in my journal, I'll be reading it and it's working really well. I'm like, okay, it's really, and then I get to this certain point and it's a pattern of mine. And so now that I know it's a pattern, I'm like, okay, choice point here. Cause I get mm -hmm. to the certain point where something's working really well. And then I get an opportunity from somewhere to cheat, like, oh, just one little bite or an extra mile a walk or whatever it is. Yes. <laughs> and I'll think, okay, I'm doing so well, I'll cheat. But what I have found through my patterns of looking back, realizing, okay, that's kind of when it went off the rails there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and I can begin to see that. And that's what I love about your idea of moving into it and writing it down. It's really helpful to see those patterns. And another thing that can come from that is I like to say, okay, what are the, what's the symptom that impacts your life the most or business? And what are, I'll use a personal example. If I get to a point where my legs are kind of really wobbly, they don't want to listen to what I want them to do. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, what I call a red flag. So by knowing your red flags and having a plan and knowing this is the impact, if I push coming back to that push through, oh, I can power mm -hmm. through this. Yeah, I might power through it, but what's the implications financially? Will I need extra care? Will I be putting extra dollars out for something? Or could I impact my business to where I lose some revenue? What's the impact emotionally of feeling like that, of struggling, of that second layer suffering if I'm not careful? And what's the impact further to my well-being? So by picking maybe two, maybe three at most red flags and the going back to that, you know, avoiding denial and avoiding hypervigilance, what are those couple things that have the greatest negative impact on my life? And then monitoring those specifically. And it, that starts, the power I can't use it that way, starts to create the landscape that has the space. You start to manage that cycle of setbacks more. You start to have a more even pace. And you're now, at least for myself and some other people I know, you've created a landscape that supports healing better, that supports finding our optimal, like you said, optimal, supporting and sustaining our op optimal abilities. I like that idea of being able to have the red flags. I remember as in, in hindsight, before the major flare that got the diagnosis and the whole shebang, you know, <laughs> when the bottom yeah. fell out there for a little bit, I was reflecting back on, there were a lot of little signs 
but I didn't know what those mm-hmm. signs meant. Yeah. But here I am eight years into my wellness journey and continuing to optimize every day. And every so often, those one of the or more of those little signs will pop in, especially around the holidays, I noticed it. Mm -hmm. But since I knew that was the early warning sign of greater, it could be greater things if I didn't take it to heart what this early warning sign was saying. But I did. I started to manage my time better, be more mindful about my commitments and my boundaries. And that early warning sign calmed down and we were able to continue on the path that we were going. But being aware of what our early warning signs are. Exactly. That, yes, you summed up very well. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm talking about. So and they yeah. can be really odd. I know when I talk about one of my early warning signs, people look at me, kind of, even doctors, medical professionals. I know this sounds weird, but my eyelids begin, the skin on my eyelids begins mm-hmm. to peel. And that's a real, I mean, you it doesn't happen. It. We're all unique. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah, that's your thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And like I said, I haven't let doctors tell me like, well, that's silly because it's not. I know that that's an early warning sign. For yeah. Me. Not to question yourself you know yourself not to question your own intuition because it's coming from a place of experience exactly (laughs) and of course i didn't know what that meant when it was happening before Mm -hmm. the diagnosis i was just like well this is really weird what what it you know what is happening and i asked a couple of medical professionals that like kind of it seems so minor they Mm kind of like don't worry about it absolutely it's turned out to be one of those major red Mm -hmm. flags that i know okay when i see that all hands on deck, <laughs> something, you got to do something. And in creating that landscape for, to support healing and greater well-being, those red flags tend to change. So you've learned to manage those more. So something that was maybe yellow comes up and that's kind of why I refer to it as balance up being centered, being grounded. And there's, you know, always improving. Yeah. To live always. And absolutely. I would say one little thing, it can be super, super minor, even if Uh, I won't even say even that's not fair, like a gratitude statement, whatever, one little thing every day, by the end of the year, you have more than the 365 little optimizations, because they build on each other. So it's amazing. One little thing each day. So we're Mm -hmm. just about out of time. How does the audience find you? My website is simoneg.net. Again, that's Simone G as in George.net, N-E-T, not com. <laughs> and on my website, there's, it's actually a program that I have, but the book, I actually, that is on my to-do list there. I have um, seven steps to business success, despite health challenges, where I go into quite a bit of this. It's a little ebook. So it's about 30 pages or so. Just email me at Simone at Simone G.net and I'll happily send that to you. And the website is www.simoneg.net. And also on my website is a song that I recently released, Courage to Be You, that came about from caregiving from my dad. And it's about letting your struggles be seen. It was part of my healing process. And it's co-written with and performed by Christina Wells of America's Got Talent. (laughs) And she's amazing. So that is on my website as well. Oh, fantastic. And we didn't even have a chance to get into the many, many sides and facets of Simone. (laughs) So maybe next time you're on, we'll talk about songwriting and being able to put our emotions out there. I think that's fantastic. What a great credit and congratulations. I'll have to go on the site and take a listen. Fantastic. And everyone will have her website up on the at understandingautoimmune.com as well. And have a great week, whatever your adventures. Thank you, Simone, for sharing your wisdom with us once again. As always, it's Thank awesome. You, everyone, enjoy. The information provided on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio, including the websites understandingautoimmune.com and lifeinterruptedradio.com, plus social media, is for educational purposes only. What you read, hear, and see on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio, and its websites, and other media outlets is based on experience only. The information should never be used for any legal, diagnostic, or treatment purposes. For the next few minutes, we will be providing a guided meditation. In guided meditation, your focus is paramount. If you are driving or operating mechanical devices, please choose a nice, safe location. As we say here, drive when you drive and meditate when you meditate. Enjoy.
in the next few moments take a nice deep breath oh and let it out with a sigh hmm. being grateful for this moment right here right now feeling every bit of you alive and well feeling healing and soothing and calming energy just tingle throughout you mm. getting stronger with each breath as your gratitude begins to grow wow oh that's right wow Taking the last few minutes of our time together here right now. Just to enjoy this growing gratitude list that grows with each moment, each minute, each hour, each day. It continues to grow. It's not just for today. Add to it tomorrow and the next day. That's right. Oh, and anchor each one with a nice deep breath. And coming right back now. Alive. Full of energy. Happy to be here. In joy. That's right. And feeling grateful. For every moment that you have right now. Oh, wow. Welcome back. Go in gratitude and enjoy your day.